This lecture will address the 10 principles of economics. So what is economics all about? Well, in a word, scarcity. The limited nature of society's resources. Time is scarce, money is scarce, inputs are scarce. And economics is the study of how society manages its scarce resources. For example, how people just decide what to buy, how much we work, save, and spend, how firms decide how much to produce, how many workers to hire if you're an employer, and how society decides to divide its resources between, say, national defense, consumer goods, protecting the environment, and other needs. Basically, the principles of economics examines how people make decisions. The first principle is people face trade-offs. All decisions involve trade-offs. For example, you can go to a party the night before your midterm, but that leaves less time for studying. There's a limited amount of time to study. There's a limited amount of time to party. You have to make that decision. Having more money to buy stuff requires working longer hours, uh, which leaves less, time, less free time, leisure time, time to play video games, time to hang out. You have to make a choice between working and leisure. If you're a business, you may have to choose between protecting the environment, which uses up resources like time and money and inputs, but you might do so by sacrificing the production of your consumer goods. Society faces an important trade-off, efficiency versus equality. Efficiency in terms of economics is when society gets the most from its scarce resources. You're basically maximizing your output given your inputs. Equality is when prosperity is distributed uniformly among society's members. Now there's a trade-off between these two. To achieve greater equality, you could redistribute income from the wealthy to the poor, but this reduces the incentive to work and produce and shrinks the size of the overall economic pie. Essentially, when you promote equality over efficiency, you disincentivize hard work because once, why would someone work very hard to earn um, a great income, to build a great business, when more of it is taken away from them when they finally uh, get there? Principle two is the cost of something is what you give up to get it. Making decisions requires comparing the costs and benefits of alternative choices. This is better known as opportunity cost. The opportunity cost of any item is whatever must be given up to obtain it. It is a relevant cost in decision making. Examples of opportunity costs, the opportunity cost of going to college for years, not just tuition, books, and fees, but also the foregone wages. You're here learning, but you could have taken this time to be working. There's a trade-off there. The opportunity cost of going to see a movie is not just the price of the ticket, but the value of the time you spend in the theater. If you go see a movie, that is time you could be sleeping, time you could be studying. You have to make trade-offs. Now, I should pause here and say, getting an education has been shown to give you a much higher income in the long run versus someone that doesn't go to college. So you should feel pretty good about that decision. Principle three, rational people think at the margin. Now, first, let's look at what rational people means. Rational people systematically and purposefully do the best they can to achieve their objectives. They make decisions by evaluating costs and benefits of marginal changes, which are incremental adjustments to an existing plan. Rational people generally try to seek their own best in, uh, outcome. Examples of this principle are when a student considers whether to go to college for an additional year, he compares the fees and foregone wages, the opportunity costs, to extra income he could earn with an extra year of education. Another example is when a manager considers whether to increase output, she compares the cost of needed labor and materials to extra revenue. The fourth principle is that people respond to incentives. An incentive is something that induces a person to act. For example, the prospect of reward or punishment. 
rational people respond to incentives. Good examples include when gas prices rise, consumers buy more hybrid cars and fewer gas-guzzling SUVs. Another example is when cigarette taxes increase, teen smoking falls. Teens typically don't have a lot of money, so cigarettes become more costly, they consume less cigarettes. Now let's look at the principles of how people interact. Principle five is trade can make everyone better off. Rather than being self-sufficient, people can specialize in producing one good or service and exchange it for other goods. Countries also benefit from trade and specialization and get a better price abroad for the goods they produce. Buy other goods more cheaply, they can also buy other goods more cheaply from abroad than they could produced at home. Simply put, certain individuals, nations, countries, however you want to say it, um, it's true for the individual, true for the nation, are better at, have a, a certain skill set that are better at producing some things versus another. Um, this is the specialization of labor that Adam Smith talked about in 1776. The sixth principle is markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity. A market is a group of buyers or sellers, and they need not be in a single location, especially in this day and age, which makes principle five a little easier, because when electronics can be produced um, more efficiently or less expensive in Asia than they are in the U.S., it's a good thing that markets don't need to be in a single location, because we can trade certain goods for electronics in other areas. A market um, is also or organizes economic activity. It means to, in order to organize economic activity, uh, you have to determine what goods to produce, what are you good at, how to produce them, what is the method for production, and how much of each good to produce, and who's going to get them. This is a lot of things to organize within a market. Now, believe it or not, this happens organically in, in terms of economics, and hopefully over the course of this semester, um, you're going to better understand that process. A market economy allocates resources through the, through the decentralized decisions of many households and firms as they interact in markets. This was the famous insight by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations in 1776 that I uh, referenced just moments ago. Each of these households and firms act as if they're led by an invisible hand to promote the general economic well-being of society. Uh, Adam Smith is, is known basically as the father of modern economic thought. Um, his book, The Wealth of Nation in 1776, The Wealth of Nations in 1776, really sparked uh, what went on to become the Industrial Revolution and serious gains in both productivity and market efficiency. Um, basically, his premise was that um, the individual and nations are better off specializing in what they do best. Uh, for the individual, in terms of a manufacturing process, uh, this could be uh, this line of thinking led to things like the assembly line, uh, where workers focused on producing one particular aspect of a product. Um, for nations, this uh, was sort of the dawn of specialization in producing um, certain things on a mass scale and distributing them to a global market economy way back in 1776. So principle six, markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity. The invisible hand works through the price system. Now, you'll come to know the what we call the quote unquote invisible hand a little bit better, but it's that thing I was talking about, about the economies organically organizing themselves, as long as the invisible hand is allowed to work. And it does this through the price system. There's an interaction of buyers and sellers that determine prices. You have buyers that are willing to pay a certain amount for goods. You have sellers that are willing to sell a certain amount of goods for those prices. Each price reflects the goods values to the buyers and the cost of producing the good. Prices guide self-interested households. Now, again, these are rational folks, so they're self-interested. They're interested in, in, in taking care of themselves, um, um, in, in maximizing their own, what you're going to learn to be called utility, and firms that make uh, decisions that, in many cases, maximize 
society's economic well-being. How do they maximize society's economic well-being? Well, first, they're efficient. They produce as many goods as possible. When many, when more of many of a good is, when many many of a single good is available, um, that good becomes more widely available, not only to to local markets but broad markets as well. And when there's more of a good available, it's less expensive, which helps the consumers. So that benefits society's economic well-being. Principle seven, governments can sometimes improve market outcomes. There's an important role for government is to enforce property rights, with, be it the police or the courts. If someone runs into your car, um, you have a property right claim. Um, you also have insurance, hopefully. Um, but you have a claim that can be taken care of by the police and or the courts uh, to protect your property. Same thing with your land, your house, and so on and so forth. Um, people are less inclined to work, produce, invest, and purchase if there's large risk um, of the property being stolen. Uh, many third world countries have a lot of problems developing their own market economies because there's no um, viable property rights. Um, they could produce something, but a lot of times it can be just taken from them. Um, so property rights are, are, are pretty important. Uh, basically sets the playing field so the ref so that the, the government the government can be a great referee in terms of property rights um, they can also help out in cases of market failure when the market fails to allocate society's resources efficiency uh, or efficiently excuse me um, this could be for any number of reasons um, causes of market failure can include externalities um, which is when a production or consumption of a good affects bystanders think of pollution um, a manufacturer uh, causes a great deal of pollution that affects society um, and other causes of market failure could be market power single, single buyer or seller has substantial influence on the market price um, an example here would be a monopoly Public policy may promote efficiency. I can tell you from experience many times it may not. But the idea is to seek a government that tries to promote efficiency, reduce externalities, reduce issues with monopolies. Government may also alter a uh, market outcome to promote equity. If a market uh, market's distribution of economic well-being is not desirable, a tax or will or um, bevy of welfare policies can be used to change how the economic pie is divided up. Again, that can affect efficiency. However, if you have something like a progressive tax um, income tax in place, uh, those that are more able to pay taxes. Um, pay a larger share, which is then used, uh, that revenue can then be used to create um, welfare programs for those at the bottom of the, of the ladder. Again, the idea of a welfare program, uh, at least the, the original intent of a welfare program, was to provide a safety net uh, for individuals in society to fall into. Unfortunately, um, in the more modern area, we've had some issues with people jumping into that safety net, but we can address that down the line. So now we look at how the, princ uh, the principles of how the economy as a whole works. These are primarily macroeconomic principles, but important nonetheless. So if you're here for micro, um, you're going to get a little macro education here. Principle eight, a country's standard of living depends on its ability to produce goods and services. There's huge variation in living standards across countries over time. The average income in rich countries is much more than 10 times, uh, is more than 10 times average, the average income in poor countries. The U.S. standard of living today is about eight times larger than it was 100 years ago. So even the U.S. poor, our poorest of the poor, uh, would be quite considered quite wealthy in um, third world countries. A country's, um, again, a standard of living depends on its ability to produce goods and services. Uh, principle eight, the most important determinant of living standards is productivity. The amounts of goods and services produced per unit of labor. How productive is the country? Productivity depends on equipment, skills, and technology available to the workers. Now, in the U.S., we're very blessed with equipment, skills, and technology. Um, so our workers can produce more units, um, 
more production per unit of labor. So the average American worker, if that's the unit of labor you want to use, is far more productive than a lot of other places. Other factors, for example, labor unions and competition from abroad have far less impact on living standards here. Now we move on to principle nine. The prices rise when the government prints too much money. Now, sometimes I mention this and, and people look at me kind of crazy, but yes, the government does print money and they print money every day. It's called quantitative easing. Not necessarily every day, but here of late, we like to print, print more money. And when something becomes more widely available, no matter what it is, it's more common. And when things are more common, it's less expensive. Okay, It's easier to obtain. Um, this is called inflation. Inflation increases the general level of prices. Now, prices respond to the value of the dollar. And when there's more dollars available, the dollar has less buying power, it's less valuable. So when the dollar is less valuable, prices must rise. In the long run, inflation is almost always caused by excessive growth in the quantity of money. So the government prints too much money, which causes the value of money to fall. The faster the government creates money, the greater the inflation rate. Principle 10. Society faces a short-run trade-off between inflation and unemployment. Now, this is a lot of the things that you'll see on the nightly news. Um, inflation and unemployment, but you may or may not know that there's a short-run trade-off between the two. In the short run, generally classified as one to two years, many economic policies push inflation and unemployment in opposite directions. Now, depending on the policy, um, if inflation goes up, unemployment goes down. Unemployment goes up, uh, inflation goes down. Other factors can make this trade-off more or less favorable, but the trade-off is always present. I don't want to get into the intricacies. We'll have a whole chapter on this between inflation and employment right now. However, I want you to know that they're negatively correlated. If one goes up, the other goes down. Just remember that. So in summary, the principles of decision making, decision -making are people face trade-offs. The cost of any action is measured in terms of foregone opportunities. Rational people make decisions by comparing marginal costs and marginal benefits. That's thinking at the margin. What is my cost for this decision? What is the benefit for this decision? That's marginal costs, marginal benefits. And people respond to incentives. The principles of interactions among people are trade can be mutually beneficial. They have something I need. I have something they need. We could trade. Markets are usually a good way of coordinating trade. It brings buyers and sellers together. Government can potentially improve market outcomes if there is a market failure or if the market outcome is inequitable. So they can address market failures and improve efficiency and also address areas where there are serious issues of, of equity. Lastly, the principles of, of the economy as a whole are productivity is the ultimate source of living standards. The more productive a nation is, the higher its living standards in general. Money growth is the ultimate source of inflation. And society faces a short-run trade-off between inflation and unemployment. This concludes the chapter, uh, chapter one, the 10 principles of economics. And you will find that you keep coming back to these 10 principles. That's why we start here. Um, so I thank you for listening to this lecture. And if you have any questions, feel free to send me a message. Thank you.